Upriver from Warsaw, the Vistula and its tributaries cross the southern landscape. A thousand kilometers long, the Vistula is the only completely Polish river. Kazimierz Dolny, a city on the Vistula, had its golden age thanks to the grain trade. The rich grain merchants built magnificent townhouses in the Renaissance style. Further east, we come to Lublin. The city was occupied by the Austrians at the end of the 18th century, then by the Russians in the early 19th century. The Lublin castle's facade has very oriental lines. Inside, the Jewish tower is a vestige of the original castle. The Holy Trinity Chapel is built right into the ramparts. And its Gothic vaults are decorated with Russo-Byzantine frescoes, which are very rare in Poland. They date back to the early 15th century and are proof of the city's multicultural character. Throughout its history, the city has suffered through many invasions and extensive damage. All that is in the past and the city is now quite peaceful. Heading towards the border, we come into Zamosk. The city was founded at the end of the 16th century, following a simple grid-based layout. The main market square is the geometric center of the city, which remained the property of the founding family until 1944. Five minutes to noon, in the tower of the town hall, a man dons a traditional cape. Noon. The man takes his trumpet and steps out onto the balcony. It's a tradition. Every day at the same time, the trumpet sounds. Further south, we near Malopolska, a mining region that's been active for centuries. This is the Vielichka salt mine. Three thousand years BC, they were already gathering the surface salt here. But the first shafts were sunk by monks in the 13th century. 135 meters below the surface is a labyrinth of galleries spread over 350 kilometers. Salt used to be worth a lot more than it is today. Marek Sizewski. The salt from the mine belonged to the king and the salt extracted from the Vielitsky mine covered the needs of the entire country. You could even say that the economy was really based on salt. One third of the king's revenues came from Vielitsky's salt. Salt was an extremely precious asset. The mine has a specific microclimate that is especially beneficial in treating asthma and certain allergies. The galleries are dotted with salt sculptures done by the miners and a variety of artists. Their works represent the local legends and in certain cases they can attain impressive proportions. Salt has infiltrated the supporting beams, so over time they've become petrified. A chapel as large as a warehouse contains some remarkable sculptures of notable personalities in Polish history and different scenes from the Old and New Testaments carved in bas-relief. Sometimes concerts are given here, for the acoustics are excellent in this large chamber.
As everywhere in Poland, Pope John Paul II has a prominent place. Lodz, southwest of Warsaw, is Poland's second largest city. At the end of the 18th century, it was annexed by Prussia and later by Russia. The Russians decided to make the city a textile center, and fortunes were made, as was the case for the Poznansky family that lived in this monumental dwelling of the late 19th century. Israel Poznansky was the owner of Lodz's largest cotton mill. His mansion, which gives a measure of his fortune, but also of his aesthetic taste, contains works of Art Nouveau, very popular among the rich industrialists of the time. The Poznansky factory was right next to his palace. The huge brick building has been fully restored. Marta Vazinyuk. The manufacturer center here were factories built in the 19th century by the Jewish industrialist Israel Poznansky. It housed the whole process for producing cotton cloth. And right next to the factory is his palace and the workers' housing. Poznansky created a whole city within the city. The Manufactura Center is now a post-industrial complex and is a good example of successful restoration. The buildings, which were not designated as a national landmark, might have been torn down. They were saved and restored to the norms of contemporary architecture and design. There's a museum dedicated to the history and production of textiles. In half a century, the industrial activity transformed the quiet little town of Lodz into a multinational metropolis. The Poznansky factory covered several hundred hectares and was equipped with the most advanced machines and techniques of the time. Agnieszka Zgendowska. The royal government granted free use of the land to attract the textile industry to this region. Starting in 1823, skilled craftsmen were flooding in to lots from Silesia, Czechia and Germany. There were spinners, weavers, dyers. Along with the techniques of production, the museum also exhibits the artistic aspect of the textile industry, embroidery and prints. Lodz was a textile center, but it was also chosen as home to a cinema school that now has a worldwide reputation. Andrzej Bednarek. Most of the internationally known Polish filmmakers have studied at our school. There's Roman Polanski, Andrzej Wajda, Krzysztof Kieslowski, Jerzy Skolimowski, and Krzysztof Zanuzzi, and the top cameraman as well. They all studied here. Like in other European countries, the Polish film industry has the backing of different government institutions, such as the Polish Film Institute. In Poland, we produce several dozen feature films per year and a good number of documentaries. The Cinema Museum is housed in the mansion of another textile industrialist. Among the different material and objects on exhibit, there's a curiosity, a 19th century bioscope. It renders relief and movement from photographs. The Lotz Art Center, which opened in 2005, is also housed in a building from the textile era. The center supports and organizes a good number of events and exhibits in a variety of artistic fields, from design and painting to photography. Lodz is experiencing an extremely creative period. Architecture is a prime example, but there are also the graphic and decorative arts. All over Poland, commercial centers are springing up. They use state-of-the-art materials and techniques to advance on the paths of renewal.
Surprisingly, a design-style hotel manages to blend into the old Poznansky textile factory. The structures of brick and metal make for a striking contrast with the elliptical openings and pastel colors. It's a very popular center for fashion designers to show off their latest collections. The paths of renewal sometimes take odd routes, like down the catwalk of a fashion show. An organizer, Jacek Klack. Someone just had to go ahead and do it for the first time. And why lots? Because this city has a long tradition in the clothing industry. In the 19th century, this was the largest cloth weaving factory in this part of Eastern Europe. And in the 20th century, it became the largest clothes manufacturer in both Eastern and Western Europe. Now, Lodz is becoming an active center for fashion designers and creators. There are major schools here to train in these professions. And this is where the contests like the Golden Thread are held. They're meant to promote young creators. Heading south, the landscape becomes more hilly. In the spring, the rivers are swollen with the melting snow. The first foothills of the Carpathian Mountains rise in the distance. The Carpathians are the only alpine-type mountains in Central Europe. They resemble the Alps in climate, vegetation, altitude, and their sharp peaks. They're divided into smaller ranges, such as the Tatras, where the town of Zakopan is nestled near the Slovakian border. Its rustic charm has made it a favorite place for Polish intellectuals, writers, and musicians. They come for the climate and for the comfort of the wooden houses so typical of the region. Jan Kapiel is an architect. This type of house is all made from wood. Before, they didn't even have cellars. The house was simply laid on four stones. It's a house that's constructed like a piece of furniture. What you see here behind me is a construction made out of tree trunks, assembled so that they notch together at the corners. And for insulation, we fill the space between the logs with wool. The Polish architect Witkiewicz developed the distinctive Zakopan-style house, a model in wood that is still very popular. Zakopan is a thriving town thanks largely to its winter sports. The funicular is an easy way to get to the ski slopes that go up to 2,000 meters in altitude. Summer bobsledding is also good for a thrill. In the Tatras range, the pasture land up between 800 and 1500 meters is used mainly in the summer. Władysław Boots is a shepherd, and with his two dogs, he's going out to see his flock. The sheep go up into the mountain in May and stay until September. With the sheep milk, the shepherds make a type of cheese that dates back to the Middle Ages. We take the ewe's milk, 
a bit of baking powder and we mix them together in a vat and then it rises and rises, uh, something like yeast. And that's how we make the cheese called Ostsipek. As soon as they've finished milking, they start making the cheese. The milk mixture is allowed to ripen in a vat for five to ten hours at room temperature. Then they do a warm ripening before adding the rennet, which curdles the milk. Then the cheese is hung so that the water and whey can drain out. Once it has rested and been hand pressed, the cheese is molded, salted, then smoked. The traditional Otsipek made from raw sheep milk has been designated regional product by the European community. So the Otsipek is now a protected trade name. The stands in the market offer Otsipek in a variety of forms, most often cylindrical or spindle shaped. Zakopan possesses other resources as well, leather and pelts from a variety of livestock. The furs are quite welcome here in this region where the average annual temperature is barely four degrees Celsius. I sell leather products, sheep and goat skins, cow hides. Here's a skin from our region, from Zakopan. The climate of the Tatras is also influenced by a very strong wind, the Halni. It can blow at almost 300 kilometers an hour. Luckily, it's a warm wind. In winter, the Halni is a curse for skiers. In summer, however, it's a blessing for drying hay and the washing on the line. There are also religious buildings of wood in the same style. In Debno, the little church consecrated to the Archangel St. Michael dates back to the 15th century. It was built with larch wood using dowels, not a single nail. Inside, the magnificent polychrome decoration has held up well over time. It boasts 33 different colors. Donations from parishioners have allowed the church to be kept up in impeccable condition. The church has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here on the shores of the man-made Lake Tchortin, two castles have been standing guard since the 14th century. They were built as border posts on the former border with the Kingdom of Hungary. Here on the shore of the Dunayets River, they rope long wooden skiffs together to form a solid but supple raft. The rafts are piloted by boatmen from the mountains, like Migdai Stankstov. They've always floated timber down this river. Right up to the 60s and 70s, they were still floating timber down the river. But that's not directly connected with what we're doing here. The people that lived on the river have always had little skiffs. They used to be made from hollowed out tree trunks. They were used to transport people and cargo. And then already at the beginning of the 19th century, they were using them for tourists. Near the Slovakian border, the road runs through Hohowuf, with its traditional wooden houses all built without a single nail. Here, woodworking is an art. Jan Zedir is a wood sculptor. I get my inspiration from religious themes, and I specialize in nativity scenes. I just did a wood sculpture of Christ for the church in Zakopan. 
It was 1.8 meters tall. Here I'm doing a Last Supper inspired by da Vinci's work, but I'm doing it in my own style, of course. As the country is so deeply Catholic, most of Jan's commissions, like his sources of inspiration, are religious.